Hello and welcome to this quick video in Linear Algebra. Today I want to show you how you can easily calculate the dimension and the basis of the range and the kernel of a given matrix. Please note there are also other names that one uses in this context. For example, instead of range, one says the image of a matrix and instead of kernel, you also see the null space of a matrix. However, it's not important how we call these two things. The definition would be important and also knowing how to calculate them. And here I want to show you this calculation by a practical example. So let's look at this three times four matrix. Because we have to calculate the range and the kernel, we want to do this simultaneously. Therefore, we do what we do every time when we want to solve a system of linear equations. Namely, we reduce this matrix to a row echelon form. And of course, this is what I show you now. First, you copy the first row in the matrix, because this is the row we want to start operating with. And you know that you want to generate zeros in the first column. This means that we want to eliminate first the 4 here and then the 8 here. So let's take the second row. And you know, you have to subtract two times the first row to get a zero here. What we get is then first a zero here, as we wanted. Then we also get a zero here. Then here we subtract minus six, so we get minus five here. And there we get minus three. Very good. And of course, we also want to do the same thing in the third row. And here you see we have to subtract four times the first row. And then we get, of course, the zero here. And then we subtract four here, so also the zero here. And then we get here plus five. And there you see we get plus three. So what you see is that we are almost finished. We just have to do one step to reach the row echelon form. Therefore, I copy the first two rows and know that I now want to generate a zero here. In order to do this, I take the new third row and just add the new second row. Then I don't change anything here, but then I add minus five and five, so I get also zero here, and but also a zero here in the last column. And now we reach the row echelon form as we wanted. And maybe I should give it a good name, so let's call it A prime. Please note that this is indeed a row echelon form because we have these nice steps here. And all zero rows, if some exist, are at the bottom. Also the elements in the corner, which are always non-zero, are called the pivots. Here in this example, we have exactly two pivots. An important thing you should remember is in the moment you reach the row echelon form, you have immediately the two dimensions here we want to calculate. That's because if you want to solve a system of linear equations, you would put all the three variables on the right. And this is also how you would get to the kernel of a matrix. To refresh your mind, the three variables are the variables that correspond to columns where there is no pivot. In this example, this means you find one free variable here in this column, and one free variable here. Or in other words, you would say x2 and x4 are my free variables. And these free variables show you the degrees of freedom you have in your kernel of the matrix. In other words, the number of free variables gives you exactly the dimension of this space. In our example, we find that the dimension is two. Now the only thing that is missing is the dimension of our range, or the image of our matrix A. However, if you remember an important theorem, you immediately know what the dimension here should be. And I'm talking about the rank nullity theorem, which tells you if you add up these two dimensions, you get out the dimension of the space you put in. Or using the matrix language, it means the number of columns. Therefore, we also can immediately read the dimension of the range from the row echelon form. Namely, it's the number of the pivots. 
Hence, in this case, also 2. Well, very good. This was the first step, finding the dimension of the range and the dimension of the kernel. And the next step is now to find for each space a basis. And keep in mind, we already know how many elements we have for the basis. Because the dimension tells you exactly this. So we need two basis elements for the kernel and also two basis elements for the range. Before we do this, I have to tell you something that is very important and is often ignored. To say it in a few words would be A prime is not A. We change the matrix, it's a new matrix. And we want the kernel and the range of the matrix A of the original matrix, not of the matrix A prime. Therefore keep in mind what we do with the matrix A to reach the matrix A prime. We only applied row operations. The good thing about row operations is that we indeed don't change our kernel. Therefore this is what we do if we want to solve a system of linear equations. We do our row operations, the whole thing gets easier, but still has the same solution set, it still has the same kernel. However now you might fear this does not hold for the range, and you are correct. In general you will change the range by doing row operations. Therefore maybe calculating the kernel might not be the problem here for you. I have other videos that explain this in very detailed form, so maybe you check them out. Therefore maybe here just very quick. We write our equations, so we have 2x1 plus 1x2, and we know x2 is a free variable, and we have 3x3, which is not a free variable, plus 2x4, which is again a free variable. And this is equal to zero because we calculate the kernel. We do this also for all other rows, which means just here the second row. And then we put all the free variables on the right hand side. And then we start from the bottom to get the leading variables only depending on the free variables. Yeah, so here we solve the first equation, which means we have here three uh, divided by five and a minus sign. Okay, and then we choose this variable depending on the free variable to substitute it here. So we put that in here and then we also have x1 only depending on the free variables. Okay, here I want to skip the details. As I said, you can check them out in another video. But you get out, for example, a factor alpha and then you get out one vector. So this would be minus 1, 2, 0, 0 plus and there you have factor beta where you get out another vector you could choose as minus one, zero, minus six, ten. Yeah, and then you know alpha, beta are your free variables. So I just renamed x2 and x4. So this is just alpha and beta in R. If we write it in this form, we can immediately denote the basis because these two vectors form a basis of our space, the kernel of A. And this fits to what we already know. We know we need two elements and we have now two basis elements. So maybe that's good enough for the kernel, but we still want to know what is the range. So let's go back to our original matrix A. Now you know by doing these row operations, we will change our range. So we don't get our range immediately from the row echelon form, but remember, we got out some information from this, namely the dimension of the range. We also know it's two. If you now remember what the definition of the range is, then we immediately get the information out. And the definition of the range is the span of all the columns of the matrix, which means the space that all the columns span. However, because we know that the dimension of the range is only two, we also know that we only need two columns to span the whole space, which means two are sufficient for us. The only question that remains is which two should we choose? These two or these two? And this is what we can answer now. Obviously we want two linearly independent vectors. For just two vectors might not be a problem showing that they are indeed linearly independent. But if we would have a bigger dimension, so we have to show that maybe seven vectors are linearly independent, then we might have a problem to immediately show that. 
and here the row echelon form helps us indeed. You see that maybe because in the row echelon form we have the zeros. If you now look here on these two vectors, you immediately see they are linearly dependent. Yeah, because this is just a multiply of this one. Yeah, so these two are linearly dependent. However, the first one and the third one are linearly independent. Because here there's a zero and there's a non-zero element. And this is what you also can do in a bigger matrix. Just choose all the vectors that have a pivot and then you immediately see they have to be linearly independent. And there you have your system of linearly independent vectors. However, they don't span our range of A because we again worked in our row echelon form and not in the original matrix A. The nice thing is now we can easily fix that by going back to the original matrix. So we know these two column vectors are linearly independent and now we choose the same columns in the original matrix. So the first one and the third one. Or in other words, we choose all the column vectors that have pivots in the row echelon form. And now we can argue with the fact that row operations don't change a system of linearly independent vectors. It says that if we start with linearly independent vectors, do row operations, we still end up with linearly independent vectors. And that is how our argument works here. So we know these are linearly independent, then we do our row operations, now backwards, and then we end with these two vectors and we still know they are linearly independent. And there we have it. We have two vectors that are linearly independent and we know the basis of the range only needs two vectors. So this is a basis we can choose for the range. Very good. So for ending this video, we write down our solution. Let's start again with the kernel. So a basis of the kernel is given. Yeah, now I use parentheses to denote that the basis is ordered. And then I put in the two column vectors here. So the first one, this one was our second one. And in the same manner, we write down a basis for our range. This one is the first column and we chose the third one, which was 3, 1, 17. And there we have it. We have calculated a basis for kernel and a basis for the range of our given matrix A. As a quick recap, remember what we did here. So we knew from the beginning that we have to calculate both the range and the kernel. And we know that for calculating the kernel, we need the row echelon form. And the idea was now don't use a second calculation for the range, but simply use the row echelon form to get also out all the informations for the range. And we saw that we might change the range, but we get out the dimension and also the columns that are linearly independent. Okay, so I really hope that helped you a little bit and then see you next time.